Um, can we just pray? Father, we do thank you for your constant, constantly unfailing love, your mercies that are new every morning. As we sung, Lord, you've never let us down. So, Father, we pray, as we've had that wonderful time of worship and sensed your spirit as we come to your word, help us to understand that that same word that caused creation to come into being, however you chose that to be, that same word is present now with us. So, Father, help us to be open to profound transformations and healing, deliverance, all of those things that your gospel brings. And may the lamb that was slain receive his due reward. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Well, uh, it's really good to be here. Thank you. It's a great privilege and an honour. And uh, I have to say, I've been very grateful, as have hundreds of thousands of others, for the wonderful music you have faithfully given us over the years. A friend of mine in Vancouver recently observed, say what you like, there's no question that massive numbers of people have encountered Jesus in Hillsong worship. So be encouraged, folks. That will never be taken away and that spiritual legacy will last into eternity. And it's not just that. You've also given practical care to tens of thousands and that too will outlast the stars. I wanna say that's a profoundly Christian combination. So from the bottom of my heart, well done and thank you. Well, I've been praying for you all over the last 12 months or so, and uh, this morning I'd like to offer a small thank you by way of mutual encouragement to stay the course and not to lose sight of the larger vision. I'd like to do this by diving deep into Scripture, and don't worry, as a friend of mine used to say, there are cookies on every shelf. So take what you can and let the rest go through. You can always listen again. What I'd like to do this morning is to remind us all of what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do in affecting his eternal purposes for the praise of his glory. Now, nowhere is this better seen than in Ephesians. But in order to appreciate its profound message, we're going to need some context. Living in a place as sheltered as modern Christian Australia, and let me tell you, Our core values are profoundly Christian, even if we don't like to admit it. It's almost for us, it's almost impossible for us to grasp the depths of mutual hostility and violence that characterized stretches, in fact, vast stretches of human history. Societies have been riddled with discord between regions, social groups, families, and individuals. In fact, I've been told if we kept killing each other, at the rate we have in the past, much of the planet would still be largely unpopulated. Now, I grant you that might seem an odd place to begin a worship service. (laughs) But you do understand the scriptures are about nothing if not facing up to reality. And if you've looked at the papers in the last few days, if there's anything to go by, this is our current global reality. Now, this is even worse in the world of the churches around Ephesus to whom Paul writes his letter. So they had the empire proudly coming, proclaiming its Roman peace, but as several of its inhabitants rightly remarked, it was the peace of a graveyard. Several hundred elite Roman families lived in fabulous wealth while vast multitudes struggled merely to survive. In fact, when the Romans first came to the wealthy and prosperous uh, prosperous cities of Asia Minor, what we now call Western Turkey, the very place to which Ephesians is written, they treated those cities like cash cows. They pillaged with abandon, stripped their assets, and grew fat on corruption and abuse. Then around 88 BC, that's less than a century before Jesus, And in recent memory for those reading this letter, the slow burning resentment exploded and in one day, one day between 80,000 and 150,000 Romans and Italians, that's men, women and children, were slaughtered. And that included Ephesus. Rome's crushing response was immediate and characteristically in kind. Now, 
It's against this backdrop that we need to hear the message of Ephesians. Got that? This is about God's answer to the long-standing contagion of human division and hostility. It's about what he has done to reconcile us to himself and then to one another by defeating all that division and hostility in Christ, thereby forming us into one new humanity through his spirit. Now that's a mouthful and it's fantastic and maybe I should say it again even though I'll pay dearly in terms of the clock. Ephesians is about what? God's answer to this long-standing contagion of hostility. It's about what he has done to reconcile us to himself and to one another by defeating all that division and hostility in Christ and forming us then into one new humanity through his spirit. I want to suggest then that Ephesians is actually about the true nature of spiritual warfare, something many of you might be interested in. How so? Because for Paul and for the Jesus for whom he speaks, at the heart of all this division lies darkly malevolent spiritual powers. Now, I grant you that seems a little odd, maybe a bit weird and even culturally impolite as we sip lattes in an upmarket what, Norwest cafe. Okay? Our culture is not so keen on talking about these kinds of things. But I think that's because we like to pretend that they don't exist, but neither Paul nor Jesus had any doubts. Now, Ephesians, coming to the letter, is unique in the New Testament. There's nothing that comes close to its opening poetic lyricism and piling up of cascading cadences. Do you like that? Pretty cool, cascading cadences. No? I'm not speaking in tongues. That's just me trying to do Shakespeare. Okay. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> Fully half of chapter one consists of a single, magnificently structured Greek sentence. Our best attempts to render this in English simply collapse into mute silence. Okay, I'm an academic. There are really good reasons to learn Greek. And while we're at it, that includes Hebrew. Your Pentecostals shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> we are Pentecostals, it's not a problem. Nor does any other New Testament work assume such a soaring cosmic perspective. Now, you know, the classic Paulines, they tended to um, engage in tense debates, for example, about the role of the Mosaic law and hence the place of Israel, that's Romans and Galatians. Or they address particular practical issues uh, that arise from unique social settings like Thessalonians, Corinthians, Philippians, etc. But Ephesians rises above them all. Paul speaks of God's eternal purposes from even before the creation. To do what? To reconcile all peoples into one new humanity. It forms the climax of the great thrust of Israel's scriptures, whether the Psalms, especially Isaiah, but also Zechariah and Daniel, where all nations are summoned to come together to worship the Lord. No other book in the New Testament does that in this way. Paul's concern is to set everything we do as Christians, and that means whether my church in Vancouver or your gathering here in the Northwest, to set all of that in the broader light of God's eternal and unchanging plan, and then to help us to understand what this means for Christians everywhere. Now you understand with such a soaring vision, poetic cadences are exactly what is required. Uh, some of you might know Psalm 68. Some of us think that that's heavily influenced Paul's thinking in Ephesians and hence the armour of God at the end of the letter. I think this also explains why this is Paul's only circular letter. Even though addressed to the Ephesians, it probably was addressed to all the Christian churches in Western Asia Minor, Western Turkey, and probably with an eye to everyone else in Paul's churches. It's designed for his largest audience, so it's a beautifully compact statement of what God, Christ, the Spirit, and we are all about. So for me, it's not Romans, but Ephesians. That is the beating heart of Paul. I think we do well to pay it close attention, and not least, folks, when in a sea of troubles, 
we need to recalibrate, to regain our bearings and to understand what really matters most. So then, being the heart of Paul, what are Ephesians' key themes? What are the foundational ideas that we need to have in our minds and hearts when we confront new situations? Where do we start? We all start somewhere. What's shaping our thinking? Am I more concerned about my fashion, my appearance, all that kind of stuff? Right? To think Christianly means to start in an appropriately Christian place. Now, what does that mean? What does it look like? I think Ephesians really helps us. And the first point is that the entire and overriding emphasis is on what God has done. Got that? What God has done. And especially in his reconciling action in Christ. Now, even though that was completely unexpected, it's now seen as the stunning centre of what God has always purposed. You understand that? What God has always purposed. And this reconciling work was for the praise of his glory and his reputation. Now, that's really important, folks. As his people, everything we do impacts the reputation of Jesus. Okay? So think about that. The next time you're tempted to do shoddy work and expect full pay, that's not, not just about us. That's about Jesus. His reputation depends on the kind of life we live. Right? We won't have time to talk about it here, but that's why the, central, the second part of Ephesians spends so much time talking about character. And uh, forgive me, we're going to talk about that in the Southwest campus tonight. I don't expect you to drive down, but it's an important part that we can't cover. The point here is that everything starts and ends not with me, not with you, not even with our churches, but with him. Right? And look at how the very first sentence begins. Blessed be God. It doesn't start with our setting. As important as our concerns and questions might be, and, and as Sam mentioned, you know, some of us have some dire questions to face. It doesn't start there. Right? Because those things can't actually provide any security or an answer. You start with God. And so blessed be God who has done what? He's blessed us. He has chosen us and destined us according to his good pleasure for the praise of his glory. Folks, it's easy to forget especially in difficult times, that this has always been and always will be his project, not ours. And it's his reputation, not ours, that's at stake. Now, not surprisingly, Luke, who's Paul's companion, shares exactly the same view, especially uh, clear in Luke's Acts of the Apostles. Whatever else is going on in that document, Luke is emphatic that behind this irresistible progress of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome is God's own hand. Nothing can stop this. Not Jewish persecution. Not the stoning of Stephen. Not even deceitful believers. Not tensions in Greek cities, threats against their lives, wrongful imprisonment, hostility beatings, nor even shipwrecks. Nothing can stop this. Now, you have to understand that. The great power behind the gospel does not come from us. It's grounded in God's deep, faithful character. You see what's going on? Forming a new unified humanity has always been God's intention. And he will see it through, folks. Whatever we might be going through, always remember he is the basis of our confidence. Now, some of you who know some history might be asking, but wasn't that Rome's intention as well? Well, actually, no. Rome never started out to build an empire, even if their myth makers later tried to pretend otherwise. They simply fought with their neighbours like everybody else. What was different was the way they offered citizenship to all those people they defeated. Right? Thus, their boundaries grew. But did it bring peace? Well, not if the preceding century was any indication. Remember, Rome itself was racked by civil wars that ranged across its empire. And when Octavian finally managed to come out on top, now humbly self-designated as Augustus, which means exalted one. Uh, you can call me Supreme Commander if you like. 
The Pax Romana was celebrated and he himself worshipped as divine. But it was no less based on violent repression. That's not what we do. As the renowned Roman scholar Mary Beard puts it, Caesar Augustus could easily be presented as a sadistic young thug, sacrilegious and extravagant, with a dangerous tendency to self-aggrandizement and platform shoes. So watch what we wear up here, okay? It might be an indication. Yes, they offered various degrees of freedom to cities, but you only had to step out of line once and reprisals would be swift and vicious. And if you've read Acts, that's exactly what happens in Ephesus. Remember the town clerk fears Roman reprisals because of their rioting. You might think rioting, yes. Ancient cities were by and large horribly overcrowded, violent and pestilent places to live. Deadly to their own inhabitants, the constant turnover fueled by newly arrived strangers meant there were minimal personal attachments and a great propensity to violence and disorder. Now you know about this in Sydney. You think of those places where people are coming in and communities are changing, where there aren't those deep personal links, guess what happens? You have violence. That's why the community you're forming here really matters because you get to know people, that really cuts down on the violence. You understand the gospel's not about some pie in the sky thing. This is about changing the world in which we live. And it was this public rioting that led to the long tradition of various ethnic groups being walled off from each other. Go to Jerusalem today and still they have separate quarters. Now, why am I spending time here? Because the gospel was never intended to be a bedtime story that you read under the covers while monsters lurked under the bed. This was the brutal world in which the gospel was birthed. Mel Gibson did at least get that right. And it was that world from the very beginning that this gospel was designed to change and radically. So that's the first thing, what God has done. How has he done this? In Christ. There is only one viable solution, and that is to be in Christ. This phrase occurs repeatedly throughout Ephesians, some 15 times. You simply cannot overemphasize how central being in Christ is for this whole thing. 1.3, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. 1.10, God planned that in the fullness of time, all things should be gathered up in Christ. Help me here, whether in heaven or on earth. God put his power to work in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, sitting him in heavenly places. 2.5-7, we've made, been made alive with Christ and are seated in Christ so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable richness and kindness of his grace toward us in Christ. And we're not even to the end of chapter two. I could go on. That's just a smallish sample, but you get the picture. Nothing compares to the centrality of Jesus. So a couple of points here, if I may. There's only one other Pauline letter that has this focus, and that's Colossians, some of which uh, is repeated verbatim in Ephesians. Now, it looks like some folks in the Lycus Valley, which is where Colossae was situated, began to think that Jesus was not quite enough. You needed something extra, maybe observing Jewish food laws or feast days or maybe elements of Greek philosophy. Paul will have none of it. Dear friends, no matter how attractively packaged it might be, if you hear some well-heeled snake charmer peddling that extra something, special fast, extra words from the spirit, abuse of the body, avoidance of marriage, special esoteric teachings, etc., that will make you just one bit more spiritual than those around you, avoid them like the plague. That the same emphasis appears here in Ephesians suggests that Paul's deeply concerned this idea might spread. And he's adamant that this great work of God is summed up in one person and in one person alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. You understand we have not come to cunningly devise fables. They saw him. 
I'm an academic, I know about philosophy. No amount of philosophy can even touch that experience. Christ alone plus nothing. Now that does raise some questions, if I may say. Thank you, Lord. He's great, isn't he? <laughs> but you know, if uh, I can maybe just ask a question here, if I can ask it kindly. Um, how well do we actually know Jesus? Think about it. How many of us with our Bible in hand could give an extended and coherent account of the events and significance of Jesus' life? No? If the Holy Spirit gave us four rather longish Gospels Greco-Roman biographies that might just tell us something as to how foundational and important a comprehensive understanding of the life of Jesus truly is. You know, there's a lot more going on here than a few sayings where we quote one verse, another verse, a few, you know, handful of miracles neatly bracketed by Nativity and Easter. Now, some years ago, when we were in Australia, I was teaching an introduction to the New Testament uh, which included some eight hours, maybe a bit more on Jesus and the Gospels. And I'll never forget one student's response. He said to me, oh my goodness, all these years I've been leading worship and I never really had a clue as to who Jesus really was. Tears in his eyes, this is amazing. Now I'm not judging him. That's what I grew up with too. Nor am I saying this to chide anybody. It's an invitation. Jesus truly is gobsmacking. And I know that's not a technical academic term, but it kind of captures what's going on here, right? No one comes close. No disrespect to the current prime minister, right? I'm assuming they're all trying to do their best job, but who would you rather listen to, right? That's not to denigrate anyone. It's simply to point out that Jesus is matchless. No one comes close to him. You'll never regret doing some serious study in scripture. Right? So can I suggest to you, folks, if you're looking for a transformed life, right, just gently, maybe spending less time on motivational talks and a bit more on Jesus might take care of all of that stuff. <laughs> Third point. Okay, Paul, this is great. How do you know? Always a good question. How does Paul know when he's rattling on about Jesus that all this stuff is true? Well, clearly not on the basis of philosophy or even theological speculation. Certainly not the latest social theory. It all comes down to his own personal and shattering experience. As the leading Torah expert of his day, he had formally made God his enemy by persecuting Christians. And even though he was caught in the very act, the glorified Jesus showed him staggering mercy. On the road to Damascus, and Katie and I were standing there a few months ago, the resurrected and blazing Lord Jesus called him to proclaim the gospel to all people. And Paul mentions that specifically in Ephesians chapter 3. It was Jesus who transformed him from a murderously angry Pharisee into someone who wanted to share the gracious, reconciling love of God in Christ with all people. And of course, his audience knows this. Why? They themselves are its fruit. Now, some years ago, I was listening to a podcast on the BBC, right? and it was on Paul. All three senior professors from major English universities agreed that there was no other way to explain Paul unless something very much like the road to Damascus experience actually happened and then he drove off the road. BBC, three senior professors. This must have happened. There's no other way to explain him. Right? And I think that's what the young man was bearing witness to at your youth celebration recently. He actually encountered the living God. Paul in his own life knew what he was talking about. And that brings us to our third point Right? Third main theme, God's new humanity. Not only had Paul's life been totally recreated, but he'd seen the same radical transformation in others all across the Eastern Empire. He knows from vast personal experience 
that Christ really does bring radical change to all kinds of people, and again, so do his audience. And I gather many of you here today would agree. You know it as well, don't you? For Paul, the defining hostility amongst humans was between between Jews and Gentiles, between Israel, who worshipped the only true God and creator of all things, and the nations who worshipped a multiplicity of mute idols, behind whom stood the demons. And having grown up in Asia Minor, that's Turkey, he'd seen firsthand the thoroughgoing dehumanising impact of idolatry, and it does dehumanise people, with all its immorality and destructive egoism. You can see why those two things have no place in the people of God. And he pulls no punches in reminding his readers of what their former life was like. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, following the ruler of the power of the air, slaves to our passions, living according to the desires of our senses and hence by nature under God's wrath. Yes, don't like to talk about that too much, but that's there as well. Actions have consequences. Later, he will exhort them to repudiate their former futile thinking with its callousness, insensitivity, abandonment to sensuality, and greedy indulgence in every kind of impurity. That's chapter four. Phew, right? Wow, kind of a mouthful. But let me tell you, if you think that's over the top, believe me, it was not, not in their first century world, and I suspect not in parts of Sydney today. As a result, they were alienated, estranged from God, having no hope and without God in the world. But even this great divide embodied in the rules and regulations of Torah, which deliberately separated you from Gentile, even this God had now abolished in Christ. That initial division that he'd introduced, now that Christ has come, it's over. Jesus' own broken body had itself broken down that wall of division, making peace between Jew and Gentile and now sharing the love of Christ. They sit down together at the same table. What would Jerusalem look like today if Palestinians and Jews actually followed Jesus? And not only God reconciled humanity to himself and Jew and Gentile, but all of us in Christ have been reconciled to one another. For Paul, God's answer to our demonically inspired division, and it does have spiritual roots, is indeed for us to be woke, but from being dead in our trespasses and sins, and then to find our identity, not in ourselves, but in Christ. You notice that? This is regardless of our race, social status, or sex. By the way, I'm not even sure gender is a Christian word. We can leave that. But these are precisely the things that lay at the divisive heart of antiquity. Their identity politics, just as they do today. But this is not for us. I'm no longer to be a poser with letters after my name to show I'm better than you. Or if I can say a woman of colour or even a person of faith. Where in the world do we get that language from? I am a follower of Jesus. And my identity is defined entirely around him. Now, what does this actually look like in reality? Well, that's Ephesians' fourth great theme, right? The hallmarks of being God's people are these things. Reconciliation, peace, and unity. Say it with me, bit of the teacher coming through. Reconciliation, peace, and unity. Give it back to me. Reconciliation, peace, and unity. Okay, now say it like you believe it. You got that? Sorry, I'm being a teacher, okay? In the midst of a divided and anxious ancient world with its fractured, dangerous and unhealthy cities, there emerged a new group. No longer at war with each other, we all belong to the one new family, brothers and sisters together. Now, when I was growing up, that language had become a bit stale, but it might be worth reviving, not least given the alienation that many of us feel in modern Western culture. So far then, Ephesians is about what? First, what God has done. Second, in Christ alone. Third, to form one new humanity. And fourth, this is characterised by reconciliation, peace and unity. Pretty impressive. Now, what's intriguing is that in spite of Augustus' self-promotion, 
right? the uber politician of antiquity. Right? Paul never mentions him once. Why not? Well, some of my friends think that what's going on here is that Paul's silence is evidence of a clandestine, under the radar, anti-imperial stance. Paul against empire. I'm not persuaded. Augustus and his successors were remarkably sensitive to anything that might have smacked of insurrection. But of the three earliest Roman authorities who commented on Christians, not one sees us as anti-imperial insurrectionists. And why not? We don't play that game. Why would you when all that game did was bring division? So hear that, brothers and sisters. Right? We're not here to ape the emperor. That's not what we do. I think Paul doesn't mention Augustus because ultimately he simply doesn't count, not when compared to Jesus. He might indulge in pagan sacrilege by liking himself, likening himself to a god, but since those gods are actually nothings, how many gods does Paul actually mention by name? Why bother with someone who's so delusional as to think it's an honour to identify himself with things that don't actually exist? Right? Folks, get your horizon shaped by the truth. And what really does matter, right? it will change the world. Now, this is not to say that there weren't tensions. Very early on, Christians meet hostility and no surprise. And I'm sure you're not, you're not unfamiliar with something similar. It happened to Jesus and from the leaders of his own people who are hardly imperial fanboys. Wherever Paul goes in his missionary journeys, he meets hostility. Numbers of people, Jews and Gentiles, get very upset. Sometimes he has to flee for his life. More than once, he suffers the less than tender ministrations of angry crowds. Our earliest Christian documents, for me, still Thessalonians. We learn there that they too experience the same hostility. Now, why is that? Acts tells us why. These men who've been turning the world upside down have come down here too. In other words, to make this about the empire is, I think, to miss the point. The gospel is much more profound than that. It's a real and present danger to the most fundamental structures and social practices of antiquity. Now, the early Christians got into trouble for two reasons, and not for following Jesus, by the way. You measure Jesus against the great ones of the day, and he doesn't rate very highly. That's not, not why people got into trouble. They got into trouble for two reasons. They stopped worshipping the ancestral gods. Right? Which meant they refused to participate in the traditional safety rites, which everyone knew had to be performed at every public event if you were to avoid the fickle wrath of the gods. You see that? Non-conforming Christians put their own cities at serious risk. That's how they were seen. And second, as the Emperor Galerius tells us, the Christians were hated because of their stubborn ignorance. And what was that ignorance? They abandoned the received wisdom of their ancestors and presumed, how dare they, to invent their own laws. For the first time in human history, for the first time in human history, a new society was growing up alongside and independent of the traditional authorities. And it was formed on the basis of a very different identity in Christ. And forgive me, not Pentecostal. I mean, they were, but that wasn't their identity, right? In Christ. And along with that came a very different grammar of life. And these are much more fundamental offences, folks. From the outsider's point of view, Christians were quite simply haters of humanity. That's why you're doing those good works you've been doing are so crucial. Because they actually repudiate that and we care about people. So can I suggest we ought not be surprised if we too begin to meet the same unwavering hostility. And it's simply because we now follow Jesus, not the prevailing cultural norms. And that's always going to be the pressure. Right? Our desires, our loves, our sexual passions, our personal identities, our angers are no longer our defining motivations. So don't be surprised if we too are sometimes despised as haters of humanity. I have friends who've lost jobs, not because they refuse to be kind, 
but because they could not affirm the more assertive woke agendas. Since Ephesians is about nothing, if not what it means to live against the grain, small wonder that it has an undercurrent of warfare imagery. And that brings us to the fifth theme, namely Christ defeated the opposing powers. And hence the concluding summons at the end of Ephesians to put on the armour of God. We'll come back to that, but you don't put on the armour of God at the beginning. It comes at the end of that letter. Just hold on to that. Now, we do know military language can upset people a little, certainly does in Canada. Uh, there's that wonderful old Irish hymn, but we nearly always, always admit, be thou my breastplate, my sword for the fight. Can't talk about that. That verse gets dropped because people are anxious about violence. But can I suggest Paul's not on about violence. What he's on about is that there is a real battle going on. There really is. And behind it stands these powers that want to create division and enmity. Now, we're not quite sure what more Paul means by these powers, not least because he never tells us. Thank you, Paul. He probably doesn't because they and he already know what he's talking about. So why explain what everyone understands? Right, we don't really get an explanation. But what we do know is that Ephesus had a great preoccupation with magic, amulets, uh, books, those kinds of things. And when they became Christians in Acts 19... The new converts destroyed 50,000 silver drachma worth of magic books. Right? That's about the price, roughly, of 50 modern houses, modest houses. You can understand why that impacted people, right? <laughs> Many individuals lived with an ever-present fear of these malevolent powers who were considered to live between the perfect heavens and the imperfect earth. And they were understood to cause division and discord, which resulted in ruinous warfare. So you wore magic amulets, uttered incantations to protect yourself. And in this respect, Paul agrees. Behind all this enmity, promoting discourse, are the demonic spiritual powers. I hope you can see why social theory is just not enough, folks. Right? This has to be a spiritual transformation. The only answer lies in what God has done in Christ. Now, can I kindly say this too? The powers were defeated by God's reconciling us to himself and to each other. And I think, therefore, according to Ephesians, the nature of true spiritual warfare is neither tongues, nor prophecy, nor church growth, and they're all good things, but rather our living in that reconciliation, peace and unity that he has bought and is meant to be the clearest demonstration that Christ has conquered the powers. Can you see that? Well, this brings me now in the final moments. How does all this happen? How does this wonderful gift of reconciliation, peace and unity, how does that happen? And the answer is, and I say it as an academic, not with a PhD from Cambridge. Right? I, mean, I, I care about study. I really do. It matters. But according to Ephesians, that's not going to be the thing that does it. It's life in the spirit. Teaching matters to Paul. Right? And we know God's people need that. Good, in-depth biblical teaching. So your roots go down deep into scripture and you draw your nourishment from there. That's critical to who we are. And even though that really matters, Paul can end up saying still, it's only through life in the spirit. Being in Christ means always living in ways that maintain the loving unity of the spirit through the bond of God's gracious peace. Now, three quick things as we go. Or four. It seems clear for Paul there's no such thing as a spiritless Christianity. A spiritless Christianity is no Christianity at all. You can't do it without the spirit. Secondly, the Spirit always points to Christ. Those so-called prophets or even worship songs where it's all about them or us and very little about Jesus, be very wary, folks. The Spirit always promotes Christ. Third, that's why when the gifts of the Spirit at work, they're always about doing what? Bringing us to a fullness of the knowledge of Christ and maturity in Him. If that's not happening, you need to wonder. Something's out of joint. And finally, this means the formation of Christian character is a singular hallmark of genuine life in the spirit. Now, I know we Pentecostals love power and that's not to be denied. 
But you and I both know that power without the character of Jesus is a terrible problem. All right, now our time's gone. Just to go through that list of things, this is God's project. It's in Christ to make one new humanity, reconciled at peace and in unity, right, having defeated the powers through the Holy Spirit. We just talked before about the importance of making a bit of a statement. I grew up in the Pentecostal church, right, and I'm well aware that altar calls can be manipulation. But I'm also aware that there's something about standing up physically, and this, God, this is God's physical world, and making a statement really does help cement stuff in our lives. But I just want to ask you now, speaking to the Christians here, as you've reflected on this, if you feel in your heart you want to say, Lord, yes, that's what I want. If you'd like to come and join others and pray toward this end and be prayed for, then now's the time to do it. Feel free to do that. Come with others. Join together as a way of saying, Lord, to this, I now confirm my life and commitment. Okay? And then secondly, um, if you're not a Christian and you're experiencing some of the stuff that Paul has spoken about and you find your heart warmed, there's something in you going, I want that. Then do know that the Holy Spirit of Jesus is present right now to come alive in you. All right, so as the band plays for us, and uh, maybe Samuel had to do this better than I do. Where is he? He's over there, right? Uh, we don't tend to have altar calls in college all that often where I come from. So maybe Sam can do this better. I just would encourage you, if you are stirred by this and it's something you want to commit to and it's something you want to see the people of God become, want to do something about it, come down and stand with us. Is that okay? Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank uh, we up, you all up standing. And we are going to create a moment to respond. What a fantastic message. What a great challenge. Here and online, I just want to grab everyone's attention just before you move. We're going to finish in a couple of moments. There are people you've come and you're yet to meet Jesus. You don't know Jesus. You know about him, but you've never encountered him. Maybe you, you haven't deliberately made a choice to surrender your life to Jesus. Well, in a moment, we want to pray for you. Well, maybe you once walked with God, but you're far from God. Do you know what? Guess what? This morning, it's your opportunity to come home. And we want to give everyone that opportunity. And alongside that, and I'm just aware of time. So what we will do is we'll do it a little different. But if you need to respond to this message, that you're going to make that decision, that Jesus, that you're going to find your identity in Christ, that you're going to do true spiritual warfare. I love that. Reconciliation, peace, and unity. Then you know what we're going to do? We're going to lift our hands and we're going to pray and we're going to believe God together. So if you've never given your life to Jesus and you need to, maybe you walked away from God and you know what? You're coming home. As we lift our hands to respond to this message and to say, you know what? We're in. We're in. We're in. Then we want you to lift your hands as well. So can we do that? Those of you that want to do that and go, you know what? That's me. I'm making that decision and we're going to sing this song. At the end of it, we're going to pray and then I want to pray over you before we finish. And you respond by lifting your hands. Weak and strong in the same.